Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and welcome to the show on a case that is 18 years old, the murder of Sarah Fox in this park in New York City. Um, and the number one suspect was a very interesting fellow. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, first, I want to welcome everybody who's here in the chat room. And I want to thank you because, um, <laughs> yes, I, I did accidentally put in 3 a.m. instead of 3 p.m. So if you were here in the middle of the night, <laughs> I was sleeping. Um, that was a typo. Anyway, so here, here you all are. Some people are back anyway. Let me say Lisa S. is here. Oh, and you can see and hear me. That's good. Thank you. Um, and do let me know if there's any kind of glitchy thing going on because I just saw one. And I've been having a few problems recently. Oh, 33 degrees. Yeah. I, winter is coming. It is coming to the East Coast, at least. Um, so welcome. Welcome, Pam. Glad you're here. Ricka is here. Uh, Christine is here. Christian is here. 12 degrees. Okay. Gretchen is here. Um, let's see who else is here. Uh, Lisa, did I already say Lisa Ann? No, Lisa Ann is here. Uh, Cassidy is here. Ann is here. Everybody's got freezing weather. So some of you aren't living in the best places in the world, like where there are palm trees. <laughs> uh, Midgey is here. Um, let's see. Uh, let me just check and feel. Benny is here. Uh, minus five in Denmark. Plus snow. I do remember those days, <clears throat> Benny, because, you know, I lived in Denmark for six months and I arrived in January and left by June. So, you know, I really picked the wrong time of year to be living in Denmark. So not, I wasn't so bright. Lynette is here. Oh, Greensland. Ah, yes, that sounds good to me. <laughs> Let's see if I missed any. I don't know if I said Gretchen already. Sandra is here. Um, and I might have missed CJ is here. Jennifer is here. Carolina is here. All right, Alisa is here. And I'm getting up toward the top. And if I missed Jenny Martin is here from the UK. Angela is here. David is here. Naomi, Marie, Jejun. Oh, I think I'm running out of time to do all this, but I want to welcome everybody who is here. Thank you for coming, and I know more of you will be coming in. Uh, and in case you would like to be in the chat room, please do join Patreon, because Patreon is what gets you into the chat room. Uh, Patreon supports the channel at a very, very low, low price a month, which is five bucks. You can come to all the live shows, and all our chats are, all the chat rooms are Patreon only, which keeps everything very nice. We have a lovely community. I uh, don't want to do that. doesn't matter. You can still just subscribe to the channel. And every one of my videos is public. So there's no hidden videos for anybody. All public videos because I want people to learn. Subscribe to the channel. Like the video. Hit the notification button. That's the bell. So you know about more things. Share in a true crime community. Um, and also, if you want a particular crime, go to the search engine at YouTube. Put in profiler Pat Brown and the name of the victim or the name of the killer and see if I've already done the show. Save yourself a lot of time. Um, Cause I have a lot of people saying, Oh, could you talk about this? And I'm like, here's the link <laughs> already done it. Um, but, and I'm also welcoming any other um, shows I, ideas you, you have. I have a long, long list now, but I try to get to um, any crimes that are truly interesting as far as profiling and crime scene analysis goes. And today I've got a really fascinating one. Absolutely fascinating. So let's get to it. Now, um, I usually use Wikipedia and I've gotten some um, people who come in and said, you know, how dare you use Wikipedia? It's not even factual. <laughs> okay, but it's easy. And it's, it's usually the basics of the crime are there. There was no Wikipedia page on Sarah Fox. So I'm going to Australian uh, news, news, news thing here. Um, and it's very interesting to me because I've gone through an awful lot of sites and this is what happens. And this is why you have to be very careful when you're trying to get information. You would be surprised how many sites play telephone. They do not actually get these, these even if they're big, big media outlets, it could be Fox, it could be C, uh, uh, CNN, it could be MSNBC, it could be the New York Times, the Washington Post. Most of them do not do their own homework. They don't do their own research. And people believe when they read it that they had a journalist who actually went out and investigated. Not true. They steal stuff from everybody else's website, uh, They from ge just general stuff. And you will see the same information repeated almost word for word across two or 300 sites. The problem is whoever gets that information out first and gets it wrong, it then is repeated hundred times over on major news sites. So sometimes I have quoted something I saw on 
10 different major news sites. And then somebody goes, well, that's not true. And I'm like, and I go check and check and check. And I find out later on, uh, yeah, uh, now there's new information that that wasn't true. <laughs> so grain of salt, understand this. Uh, also understand if this is not a case I have personally worked on and this one I haven't. I In this case, uh, not much information has come out on the crime scene. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff I do not know. If I could look at the crime scene photos and the autopsy photos, I might have more information. I don't, and it's never been out there. So what I'm doing with this channel is saying, based on what I know, here's how a profiler would look at it. Here's how I would analyze it. So it's an educational channel, not a channel that says, I know who did it. And please do not write below, you know who did it, because you don't. <laughs> In any of these cases that I have up here, unless the guy's been convicted, you don't know who did it. And a lot of times I try to actually um, just remove those comments because I don't like absolutes on there where somebody says, oh, I know that guy's the killer. Even if I believe you're right, <laughs> I'm still going to say I don't know because he hasn't been arrested and convicted. And I'm going to say he's a good suspect or a good person of interest. And here's why. But I can't say that person did it because I do not know and neither do you. Unless you're married to him. <laughs> Maybe this guy. But um, anyway, so I'm going to get into this now uh, to the, the murder of Sarah Fox. I'm going to use this one uh, basic thing from Australia. And this is one of the first ones I read. So I had misinformation from this site. And it was just written four, uh, four years ago. Yeah, I think it was four years ago. So they, the actual information, much more information had been out across the major sites for a long time out of the police reports, and it's not included here. So this is how you can get misled really easily. So I'm going to let you know the basics here, and then I'm going to tell you where the truth actually lies or what information has come in since that wipes out a certain aspect of this crime. And that's important because when you're analyzing a crime, even if you're working with the police, you could have a particular version of what you think happened. And then when you get more information and in, say from uh, some from the um, the coroner or some for, from a witness, then you go, oh, that changes everything. And that happens with this crime. And and so my analysis of this crime, as I was reading through things, changed. And I came up with my final conclusion of what I think is most likely but it didn't start that way because I was missing information. So let me get to it. Um, so the murder of Sarah Fox, in this particular uh, headline is, remains a cold case 14 years after her death. And now it's been 18 years. When Sarah Fox was murdered in 2004, her naked body was discovered in a ritualistic position. It only got stranger from there. Now, this is a great headline. So you go, oh, my God, something ritualistic. And it even gets worse than ritualistic. The, so the first problem is going to be the, the term ritualistic. What does that even mean? The police never said if, if they said it was ritualistic, they never explained why it was ritualistic. So therefore, we don't actually know if it was ritualistic. So there's a there's a problem right there to begin with. All right says uh, she used to go to a, she was a Juilliard college. She was a student there. Um, and so what happened was she left her apartment. She's 21 years old. Uh, she left her apartment one day to go jogging in the nearby Inwood Hill Park and never returned. She went jogging. Now, I, I go through this quite often about jogging and how dangerous it is for females. So, for example, here you have a, I'm kind of in the way here, but you see that see that path going back there? All right. You could run that path every day for a year and be perfectly fine. But one day, if you're on that secluded path and somebody else is there too, and serial killers do love secluded paths. I'm not saying this is a serial killer crime, but this is a kind of path a serial killer would like. Or any other kind of character who's walking down this path. And you might have run, let's say, for example, you might be running along, jogging along, walking along, and you haven't seen anybody in 15 minutes. And then you come upon the other person. Guess what? They haven't seen anybody in 15 minutes either. So there's nobody else on the path. Just you and whoever that creepy dude is next to you. And if you're lucky, you just go like this and you pass each other and you keep going. Or sometimes you'll be going along. Somebody will be coming up behind you and you can keep running, but they're still behind you. And again, 
it will be the two of you on the path. So secluded places are not safe places for especially women. So it's just something to be, to be recognized. So I'm, I'm not blaming the victim. Everybody has a right to run where they want to run, but it is not necessarily safe. And this was even, a, 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 this happened during the day. And we're not, we weren't even talking dawn and dusk, which are the two top times to get murdered on a, on a dog, jogging path. But even during the day, if it's a very isolated location, you may not be coming home. So that's where she was. So she never returned. The students mounted a, a major search effort with the police. Uh, the police did a very large search of this, this entire area, and they did not find her body. Her body wasn't found for, I think it was five or six days. Interestingly, her body actually was found by a search party put together by citizens, which is un unusual. You know, you always think, you hear about these search parties, and you assume they're going to find a body. Almost always they don't. The police searches usually turn up nothing, and the searches by citizens usually turn up nothing, in spite of all their hard work. And the reason is, Sometimes the areas are so large and the area where the body may be in, which could be in a ravine or just under a bush or whatever, just isn't seen. It's just missed. Usually uh, bodies are found by hikers, joggers, dog walkers. Uh, if you remember Chandra Levy, who wasn't found in a Rock Creek Park for a whole long time, her body was found by a guy searching for turtles. No. So in this case, the citizen group actually found her body. So Kudos to them. I mean, that's not, 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 not usual. <laughs> so anyway, they did find her. six days after they found her body. Her naked body was found in a secluded wooded area of the park, partially decomposed. Now, the, she had been there a long, almost a week in, in, out in nature, and, and it had rained and other things, so not a good situation. The decomposition thing kind of wiped out a lot of the ability to find out certain things about what had happened to her. They did know she had been strangled. Uh, and then posed in what police described as a ritualistic position, which we have no idea what the heck that means. Her body was surrounded by tree branches and two dozen yellow tulip petals spread evenly in a circle around her body. And this is where the ritualistic thing also came in, where everybody started saying, oh my God, what was this? Some kind of satanic worship thing? Was this some kind of just some guy with a weird concept where he had to do this to her and then put these flowers around her. I'll get to that in a minute. Chillingly, a botanist called to the crime scene, examined one of the tulip petals and declared that it had only been picked between 24 and 48 hours before the discovery of her body. So in other words, her body was laying there for a few days and then somebody picked these flowers, came back and, and placed all these flowers around her body from elsewhere in the park because there were no tulip trees there. And when I read this originally, I'm like, wow, that's fascinating. You know, that's a very unusual crime. But then I read this. All right, let me, let me find this. Hold on a sec. And I thought, wow, you know, this changes things. All right. The confusion over the tulip tree branches and flowers at the crime scene. This is from the New York Times now. Developed after the police department initially consulted a parks department botanist who went to the crime scene on the day the body was found according to the investigator. The botanist did not see a tulip tree near the body and concluded that the branches, which still had flower blossoms on them, had been placed there. But a second botanist from the New York Botanical Gardens in the Bronx was consulted on Wednesday. After visiting the scene, the person noticed a tulip tree near the place where the body had been found. Ah, you see, there was a tulip tree. The first botanist had missed that tree either because the branches and blossoms on the tree were about 50 feet up, or perhaps because the daylight was fading when he visited the site. So the actual possibility that there was rain and wind since had brought down some of these flowers and branches around the body. So now you see how that changes things. So nobody came back to the body and put flowers around it. Now there are some people who will still say, well, I think the, the flowers seemed like they were placed too circular, circularly around the body. I don't know that that's true because, again, I don't have crime scene photos. I think it would be pretty unusual for somebody to come back and do that, uh, but I'm more likely to believe the second botanist was correct. And here's where you have the problem. One person says this, and they're an expert, and you go with that, and the whole case just goes to hell. <laughs> because now you're looking here. Second botanist comes in and says, 
did you see the tree? And you're like, ah, oh, crap. Now your whole, your whole case can go the other direction. So, so we can take away the flowers as any kind of absolute on ritualism. So now it would just be how her body was placed or looked when they found the body. Does that mean ritual or does that mean staged or is it just something fun the guy liked to do? You know, some people call this signature. Um, I'm not overly fond of the signature concept, but sometimes a signature was supposed to mean is that the guy did something he didn't need to do for the crime. So let's say he raped, he's raped and strangled her and now she's dead and he decides he's going to, hmm, let's pick something weird. Uh, he's going to put her, oh, this is a simple example. You put, you put her hands on her chest like this, crossed on her chest, and then he took her feet and crossed them as well. What does that mean? Maybe he just thought it was funny. <laughs> and it doesn't mean, the problem with signature that people don't understand is, is this concept that came up through the FBI that signature would be something the guy would do across a number of crimes. And you see this in you see this in movies all the time. The guy does the same thing every crime. So there's like five girls with their hands like this and their feet like this. That's not usually what happens. And it oftentimes it's just one time the guy goes, "Oh, that's kind of funny. I'll do this and this." And then the next time he kills a girl, she doesn't he doesn't bother at all. So for that one crime, he did it because it amused him, but he doesn't necessarily do it for other crimes. And then you have to wonder why did he do that? So did he do it for amusement? Or was there a purpose, which is staging? If you stage a crime scene, it's because you want the police to think it's something different than it is. And I have a feeling toward that. And I'll explain that later why I think that may be true. All right. So so now they so they figured out not so big on the flower thing. Right? <laughs> so now they had a problem with um, the advanced state of decomposition. Uh, they did not know they did not know if she had been raped. Um, so that was unfortunate. Um, then, uh, let's see what happened. Let's go further. All right. So there's another very bizarre story that comes out of this whole thing. And this, this is that, and let me find the article on this, because this is another thing that was completely threw every, everything off. Um, hold on one sec. All right. This was a DNA match. So what happened was, during Occupy Wall Street in New York City, they had a chain somebody had put somewhere and they had taken DNA from that chain and they had put it into CODIS to try to find out whether the DNA was going to match something. And it came up with a hit and it came up with a hit on Sarah Fox's Walkman that she had had with her when she went jogging. And it was found on the ground there at the scene. They had taken DNA from there and it matched, it matched the Occupy Wall Street DNA. It's like, what the heck? So the one of the people who was protesting out at Occupy Wall Street was also the killer of Sarah Fox. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Not so. Now here, here we go with, you know, that could have, that did for a while throw everything off. And then we find out what the truth is. All right. Remember what I always talk about with touch DNA. Touch DNA is usually made from skin cells. Skin cells are easily transferred. It's, it's not semen. It's not saliva. It's not blood. It's not something that shouldn't be there no matter what. Skin cells transfer super easily. And it can even go from one place to another, be blown over. I mean, touch DNA is a real questionable methodology. Can be useful, but you can't take it out of context. So you might, let's say you have a robbery, uh, a burglary in somebody's house, and they found, find some touch DNA on uh, something, like an inside doorknob. And that touch DNA comes back to a guy who is a 20 time burglar and that the family did not know and didn't, and he was never in their house. Good information, but sometimes it can just be, let's say somebody touched somebody, something, and then that something was touched to something else. And so something that's completely uh, disc not even connected with the crime. Let's say somebody touched your coat and went like this and their skin cells got in your coat and you came home and threw your coat on a chair and then they got DNA that touched DNA off the chair and it matches some guy who was, you had, had passed you by in a, I don't know, at a carnival, you know, and now that guy's a, a suspect and he's like, I didn't do that. And if he's really unlucky, he doesn't have an alibi. If he's super lucky, he has one. And then you can say, well, it's not him. So touch DNA is questionable many times. Now here's what happened though. All right. So what happened was they found this touch DNA and they finally figured out after they did 
all the, the studies that the touch DNA, let me find it here, came from uh, came from a police department employee who works for, with the Office of Chief Medical Examiner. Somebody in the police department who worked in that thing touched both items and had nothing to do with the crime. So there we go. It wasn't the all, so that that DNA was worthless. So now we're back to we have no idea who did it until we come to this guy. And see, there's his doggy, and this is a guy who is a dog walker in that park. Now, I'll stop here for a minute just before I get to him and all the things he, all the crazy stuff about this guy who became the number one suspect. Uh, let me let me see what y'all have to say before I go there. So, um, hold on a second. I'm going down the, the whole chat room here. Um, Okay, um, so now uh, going back to the signature issue, because I, I find this is, um, I find that the, the signature thing is is very concerning in that it's overused and it is, I think, entirely misunderstood. Um, and it's become such a popular type uh, concept. Gretchen says, isn't the signature of a serial killer the method that they use? No, it's not. That That is the modus operandi or MO. So the method that you use, let's say mm, uh, you're, you like to climb through a window, like a cat burglar, and then you climb through the window and then you rape and murder the woman in her bed. That's an MO. And then if you find a woman who is um, a guy jumps out of the park and kills her in the park like this crime, you might say, well, the MOs are totally different. The guy, one guy is, goes in people's houses and this other guy jumps people in, in, in the park. Different MO, but guess what? It doesn't mean a different guy. <laughs> Sometimes guys switch up their MOs and that's what confuses things. Also, there are guys who use the same MO. There's a lot of people who jump joggers in the park. Why? Great place to find a victim alone. And you don't have to have much ability. You know, you just, all you have to do is be in the park. Um, you don't have to break into a house. Just, just be in the park, hit the woman overhead with a, a rock or, throw your belt around her neck or punch her in the face. I mean, it's so easy. You drag her into the bushes, do what you want, and you walk away. Very easy crime to commit compared to some fancier things where you have to abduct a woman, get her into your car, take her to your dungeon, <laughs> all that. Um, now, there are things that I, I call, I put serial killers, for example, into two categories, fast and slow. I mean this by the guy who jumps somebody in a park serial killer in the park. Usually it's a fast crime. He's it's, it's more, very rage filled in the sense that he just wants that moment of power and control. Uh, he, he kills and he rapes very quickly. He doesn't spend time there. And then you have the type that abduct and torture and keep the woman for quite a while or that boy for quite a while, whatever, whoever they took. And sometimes even in a dungeon or at least in a private location where they can mess with them for a few hours before they dispatch them or a few days or a few months. Slow guy, a slow guy over here, fast guy over here. The fast guy says to the slow guy, you're a creepy dude. <laughs> I mean, you want to keep women and torture them? You're sick. <laughs> and, and the guy over the other guy says, well, you, you know, you, you got rid of him in 10 minutes. What was the point? <laughs> Don't that. So to me, fast and slow. I'm looking at the screen here. Doing side my fast and slow goes on. Whatever. One is fast. One is slow. That tends to be more of a signature in a strange way than you know, um, it's, it is a meth, It is a method of operation. It's a modus operandi. It's an MO. It's how they perform things. Uh, some use guns, some use knives, but again, they don't always use the same weapon. Um, sometimes they use a knife the first time and then they get blood on themselves and they say, I'm not doing that again. Next time they strangle. So the MO changes depending on the crime. So it can, it, it's not a locked in thing either where this, you can match these things so easily. Signature is supposed to be clear. He does something so weird that if he does it more than once, you go, that's that guy. But signature is extremely rare. Most guys don't have the time for it. Um, so they don't do that many weird things. Once in a while you get, there are a few serial killers out there who have done something which is a signature style thing over a few crimes. And uh, 
because they like the notoriety. They like being connected to those crimes. Um, but it's, it's fairly rare, is my point. It's fairly rare. Um, so, oh no. <laughs> Sarah says, I look every time you say my name. You are still with us, Sarah. You are. Um, <laughs> um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, um, yes, that is my, that is my saying. And I should put that on a shirt. You know, when I, everybody says I should get a merch store someday, I'll put that on a shirt. There are no victims, only volunteers. And this is not, and somebody got really angry at me and goes, how dare you? I'm like, no, this is the viewpoint of the killer. This isn't me. This is the killer's viewpoint that there are no victims, only volunteers that in other words, that that person put themselves in a situation where they volunteered to become a victim. For that killer so they put themselves in a vulnerable position and that's a killer thought not mine but it's not um, it's, it has its truth truthfulness to it we, we we do things as human beings that put ourselves at risk and sometimes we do it because if we don't we won't have a life you know you you oh you i mean i've, I've driven for years at night i mean and people go oh my god that's dangerous to drive at night in some of the areas you're driving in i knew that so i was taking a risk but it was my job and I was willing to do it. Which the, my point always is this, you have to be able to evaluate the risk and decide whether it's worth doing. You know, we have things that we can take risks on because they are worth it. And other things which are so stupid, you're like, why don't I do that? <laughs> that was dumb. I could have been dead, you know? So um, let's see. Uh, all right, I think I've gone to the bat. Okay, so I want to get on to this guy. All right, now this fellow, oh my God. Okay, hold on a second. I have to take a drink. This guy, he became a suspect because he told the police what happened at the crime scene. Let me find, oops, I'm on the wrong, sorry, I'm on the wrong thing here. Let me go back to the basic, uh, not so well written, <laughs> but useful Australian version. Okay, here we are. All right. So his name is Dimitri Scheinman. Um, now, this was a popular park for joggers and for dog walkers. And he was a dog walker. Um, and so that let many people would contact detectives to say, hey, this is, I saw this weird guy or whatever. Dimitri Scheinman, 39, had made many enemies due to his habit of stalking the park with his, his ferocious dog off the leash. Now, I don't know how ferocious his dog was, but he does not like to put his dog on a leash. And I find that very interesting. It says, I'll read you a little bit of what he actually says about that, which let me find it. It's, 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 oh, okay. I want to say that his, he, he was from Russia, I believe. I don't know how, how good his English is as far as um, his total command of it. Although he'd been in, in the U S a very long time. Uh, so he been in a couple of decades, he could speak English, right? Uh, his writing uh, is, he, 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 let me, let me show you. He, he came here as, let me just tell you a little bit about his background before I go on to why he became a suspect. Because you just have to, <laughs> you got to know a little bit about this guy's background and, and what, the way he thinks. He has a website. Let's see if I can throw the website up here for you. And it is bizarre. It is very bizarre. Um, this is his website. It's called the Shineman Source. And he puts out this different information here. He's got, he's got a book called, is he friendly? That means the dog. And I, I bought the book and it's very painful. And I'm going to read you some parts of the book. So you're going to get a, an idea. Uh, and he also has information about his families and all that, his background. So from his background, he, let me find it here. Okay. Hold on a second. All right. Just, <laughs> This is worth it. Just reading this. It's, it's awful. He's a terrible writer. God, God knows he's a terrible writer. His book did not sell well. It's only like, like, like three reviews that he got friends to write because it's awful. So don't buy it. My God, don't buy it. Um, family history. It just says Victor. He, 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 this is something I'm going to point out later. He writes in the third person. Victor's parents met in Moscow. His father was fairly good looking nondescript engineer, and his mother, a spoiled Jewish princess who held a pharmaceutical degree. They had absolutely nothing in common except for their shared destiny to have Victor as their son. 
<laughs> now, mind you, he changed his name to Victor. His, his name is Dimitri, but he changed his name to Victor when he wrote this book. Uh, and he's calling himself Victor on his website. He's changed his name. But talk about a level of narcissism that's off the charts. They had absolutely nothing in common except for their shared destiny <laughs> to have Victor as their son. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, mm. All right. So Victor was born in Moscow and his name is Dimitri. So just in case you're getting confused, this is Dimitri who is calling himself Victor. Uh, Victor was born in Moscow in 1964. He was badly burnt on his back in the incubator to which the nurses responded, don't worry, one less Jew. So you can see he's got a complex here. He has a really bad complex and everybody in the story except him is never quite the good guy. Um, Victor's parents named him Dimitri, but everyone calls him Dima. Uh, until he was 12, he grew up in a, uh, he grew up in Moscow in an apartment. And let's see, when did he come to the United States? Um, let's see, he liked to fight. Okay, what else did he do? Spent some time on the Yalta, on vacations. Let's see. His, shortly after his parents divorced in 1977. Victor and his mother immigrated to America with two suitcases and a painting of an old rabbi. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, he will never forget the chilly morning they left Mother Russia behind, beginning with a taxi, whisking them away to the airport, a new lifestyle behind, beyond the Iron Curtain. So they went to San Francisco and his father went to New York. And let's see. Um, at 15, he went to live with his father in New York and he enrolled in John, uh, John F. Kennedy High School replete with escalators, rats, and badly behaved students, numbering in the thousands. Okay, then he got to go, you know, study Kung Fu. All right. Eventually, then he goes back to mommy, who's remarried, and then he goes to Israel uh, to work on a kibbutz. Victor labored with great zeal, but was asked to leave the day he brought his Palestinian amigos onto the kibbutz for a visit, and they tossed him off the kibbutz. Um, then he returned to New York to study art. Now, let me just show you that guy the guy's art, which I will say, I didn't think it was bad. I, I mean, he should have stuck with that and stopped. Don't, don't write, dude, because you can't write. But uh, <laughs> here he is in his studio, and here's some of his, his work. So it's it's um not bad. I mean, I looked at, through it, and I, I, you know, I, was, I almost expected to see absolute garbage, but I was fairly impressed. He has kind of a, a dark theme, a lot of... um dark darker skies reddish stuff russian stuff there's military stuff um yeah kind of uh, deep as opposed to light and cheery uh, apparently not as but he did this for like 12 years and was not very successful so you know well you know being an artist isn't isn't exactly an easy thing to be so i'm not going to say i blame him for failing to become a great artist um i don't know I, i'm not an art critic so i can't say his art is great or it isn't great i just think it's not bad so then he marries a woman named Jane, who is an architect. And now he's married to her, and he has this child, this first child, and they get the dog. All right, so I want to read to you what he said about the dog. Okay, so let's go to the doggy. All right, so this is the doggy, and the dog's name is Burundi. All right, now, this is what's fat. You have to look at the way this guy's brain works and, and what is, his, his whole mindset is. The, their first daughter, Anna Rose, was born in 2002. So I think that's Anna Rose, and then there's another kid, and now they're bigger. All right. The family took long strolls in local parks as well as hikes in the greater New York City area, letting Burundi chase deer, wild turkey, and swim in the Hudson and upstate lakes. Like many other young New Yorkers, the couple was also at the beginning stages of taking a deep dive into the nitty-gritty of what was to be family in the post-9-11 United States of America. Okay. In the middle of dog walking discussion. <laughs> like, um, walking Burundi, the most perfectly well-behaved canine. Perfectly behaved. Mm -hmm. Both Victor and Jane kept having confrontations with people who persisted with the question, is he friendly? Th this, that is how the name for the book, which is, came about to be written, has a double meaning. Is he friendly? Because is Victor also friendly? Who is really Dimitri? All right. So, um, now, where's the next part here I thought was fascinating? Um, all right. The, he has a whole thing here about the dog. Let me find the part from the book because 
it gets even more interesting about the dub. Okay, let me find it. Hold on a second. No, well, that's not what I want. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on a second. All right, the dog walker, this part of his book, the dog walker. And you can start seeing um, exactly how he writes, which is why he, nobody wants to read his book outside of being, uh, shall we say, mentally, some, something's wrong with his mind. Let's put it that way, in my opinion. And we'll find out why later. But the dog walker part. If you enter Inwood Hill Park with a well-trained dog and a belief that your pet should not be leashed unnecessarily. So he thinks his dog has rights over people and over the law because if he thinks if he's trained his dog properly, it should be, off, be able to be off the leash in spite of the signs that say your dog must be leashed. Um, if you, so if you uh, enter the park with a well-trained dog and a belief your pet should not be leashed unnecessarily, chances are your experiences will be very unpleasant. Only stubborn eccentricity and bravado can imagine, inspire one to break the leash law. No, no, narcissism gets you to break the leash law, dude. <laughs> you know, the fact that you don't think you have to follow the laws that everybody else has to follow, that you have more rights than anybody, or you, don't, you just don't care what other people think. That's your problem. Um, most will comply simply to avoid the hassle. Beside, besides, a few cleverly positioned lucky ones, society conveniently allows no quarter to spare for any dissent outside the norm. All right. The standard bearers in the Western world are people rationalized into utter restraint. When this populace becomes dog owners, they are not able to control their pets, expediently thinking others cannot either. Thankfully, a quick surgical intervention produces nicely behaved canines. As a result, in the civilized corner of communal greenery, words as innocuous as, I fixed him yesterday, can easily roll off the most timid middle class lips. And of course, vets never object. Oof. That's the writing of his book, which is why you don't want to buy it. Oh, my God, it's awful. Okay, but let's talk about what happened with his dog. Victor was a permanent fixture in the park. Me, myself, Dimitri. Is that his name, Dimitri? Now I'm forgetting what his real name is. <laughs> yeah, Dimitri. <laughs> it's like I've said Victor so long, not long now. Dima, Dimitri. Um, Victor was a permanent fixture in the park, taking his dog out twice a day. He was unhappy, missing his old life sensing that he used to capture something essential that matters through his work. Now, after not expressing himself for years, he had a constant hollow sensation that an important understanding was eluding him. Fortunately, dog walking, an activity he would never have thought of engaging in before, having been marooned for more than a decade painting in a basement studio, enabled him to slowly get a grasp on that particular something, a point of reference from which to begin understanding the world anew. So he's going to AA meetings. He's taking his daughter out there and stuff like that. But apparently he had issues with other people and the dog walking. He, when he was out with his dog off the leash, people are like, hey, 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 your dog's off the leash. And he's like, too bad. And they're like, well, is he friendly? And it got, got him mad. Well, apparently enough people asked that because they were scared of his dog. Okay. They were scared. And at one point uh, later on, he a guy came up to him, uh, the, the dog, um, they, there was a confrontation with another man. He punched the man in the face. He ended up on Rikers for like three months. He didn't get a long sentence, but because of his aggression, he punched this guy and knocked him out. Um, he claims that he claims that guy's dog jumped on his wife's pregnant wife's tummy. So you see, his dog is fine. No matter what, never on the leash, but other people's dogs, you know, different story. I guess they haven't trained them properly. But this was going to become an interesting issue and why I think the way, the way the crime may have gone down may have to do with this guy and having a dog that's not on a leash. Okay, and his twice daily walks through the park, he spent a lot of time in the park and he made a lot of enemies. People did not like this guy. He creeped them out, his behaviors, his dog's behaviors, his re refusal to follow the law upset people and they, they were uncomfortable around him which is why eventually he kind of came to the attention of the police. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that what we hear in most of the reports is that he went into the police station and started telling them about trying to help them with the crime and saying he was a psychic. 
And this is how I knew about the crime. I'm a psychic. and I know this is what happened. That's what most of the, the websites will tell you. That is not exactly what happened. And in his own words as Victor, um, it doesn't seem to be quite that way. And let me read you how it actually supposedly. Now, mind you, this is still his book, but I don't see why he would be writing this in his actual book. And let me show you then this book here. His book is this. Is he friendly? Yeah, it's got three ratings. Um, it's horrible. And I I did buy it and I may return it and just say, I can't, you know, you can return books to Amazon. I haven't read much of the book because it's so awful. I just may return it and say, I can't read this junk. Please give me my money back. And they usually just give you your money back. So I probably will do that because it's that bad. <laughs> it's that bad. Let me, let me show you some of the things in this book. Dog Walker, Dragon's Tale, his first visit to the 34th precinct. And that's when he goes in and talks to them. And then he's got a second visit to the 34th precinct. And then he's got a whole bunch of weird stuff, which it, it, you can't you can't get through all of these other chapters of nonsense. So you really don't want to waste your time with that. So um, let me read what he says, though. Now, so in those stories you could read online, they'll simply say he went to the police like a good citizen. Like he'd been in, he, not that he'd seen what, not that he knew what happened, but that he had this psychic vision. And you think, oh, he's claiming he's a psychic and he's telling what happened at the scene. That is suspicious. Not exactly what happened. That day began as any other. Victor finished his work uh, and then he went for a stroll. So he's walking along with his dog without the dog being on the leash. And he sees a black sedan rolling on the grass toward him. So he quickly leashes his dog. And then he realizes it's not the green SUV belonging to the park rangers. And then somebody gets out and says, can we ask you a couple of questions? Staring at Victor was a face, affable and yet somehow so insensible. The detective appeared unaware that his one eye was squinting in a cunning way. <laughs> don't, don't, don't write again. Don't ever, ever write again. His, his one eye was squinting in a cunning way. His official looking mug. He, you know, he likes to use extremely exaggerated, verbose type of horrible writing style where instead of writing what it is, he has to add in all these adjective and adjectives. And he must've looked in a thesaurus or something and said, well, let's not use the word face. Let's use some other, oh, mug. Let me use mug. It was full of concentration, affecting Victor at that moment to somehow consider it appropriate for authority to be a little rude. Sure. By the way, my name is Steve. The man showed his badge. And this is my partner, Ricardo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Next to him sat a pudgy man stuffed in a suit, eyes bulging. <laughs> My name is Victor. Victor shook hands with Steve through the window. We are asking a lot of people for help if they know any information that can be helpful in, in the in investigation into Tara Wolf's murder. Now, mind you, in the book, he calls himself Victor and he calls uh, Sarah Fox Tara Wolf. Now, there are two reasons for doing this. One is I've used, uh, you know, Sometimes you cannot use the real name of the person in the book. They recommend you do not do that so you can't get sued. So you write it as sort of uh, either uh, sometimes it's almost fiction. He's trying to almost fictionalize it so that he's not, you know, he can't be blamed for something. But yeah, everybody knows Victor is him and, and Sarah is this, uh, what is the name of it? Tara, Tara Wolf. All right. Victor had nothing to say. He was proud of his disinterest in sensationalized local news, even to the exclusion of major events in his own park. I think this is fascinating. He is disinterested in a woman who is brutally murdered in the location he walks. And I had another suspect in another crime say exactly the same thing to me. He walked through a park where a woman, right where he had walked through, the woman was murdered. And he told me, well, if I didn't know her, it didn't matter to me. That's kind of creepy. Um, I mean, maybe it, I can understand where maybe sometimes on the Internet people get too too attached to people they don't know and victims they don't know. But if it's a victim that is murdered exactly where you are in the, the place where you walk, you should have more emotion toward that. And he's like, yeah, not so much. Then they ask him, do you know this park? Well, oh, no, that put a spark into the conversation. I know this park inside out. So indeed, you could, you know, blah, blah, blah. He dropped the leash and he told Burundi, I'm skipping some because you don't want to go through this, uh, dropped the leash and told Burundi to sit, experiencing the confidence of a dog handler showing off a well-behaved canine 
even if he knew they did not give a damn whether the leather strip was in his hand or lying on the grass. <sighs> okay, let's not read this stuff. All right. They ask him, are there a lot of bums in the park? No, there are hardly any, Victor paused, gazing at the trees. The park is certainly freed of bums except for, well, there's this one Asian guy who carries plastic bags with him and he sleeps in the parkway's underpass. Noticing that uh, detectives raised eyebrows, he hurriedly concluded, but I haven't seen him lately. God forbid something happens to the guy because of me. Oh, now he's terribly concerned. Okay. Uh, you know, we're interested in any suspicious people you've seen in the park. Nope, no one comes to mind. Nobody comes to mind. The cop was squinting again. I walk here after dark as well. And believe me, this park is absolutely empty even at night. So you, you can see that he walks in the park a lot. He and he's not just walking in one little circle. He's walking a great deal of the park. He knows the trails. He knows who's on those trails. This is a guy. I'm not saying he's stalking. I'm just saying he's very, he's very aware, as he's saying, of all the trails in the park. Now the eyebrows are really raised. You told us you know this park like the back of your hand. I certainly do. Then why do you think the murder happened there? Steve pointed at the spot where the Henry Hudson Bridge connected Manhattan to Bronx, was protruding from the canopy. And I'm not quite sure where they skipped some information here. Victor turned that direction, but his attention was diverted by the man's ring, which looked to him to be as silly as a piece from a toy set. It was large and gold and decorated with stunning blue glass. What an ostentatious police academy, or perhaps a high school graduation ring. Who the heck cares, guy? Why are you writing about this? <laughs> anyway, after he stopped staring at the finger, he looks at the area they're talking about. And here is the area they're talking about. Uh, so, and it, it's interesting in two ways. Um, this is the bridge area. And this is where she's murdered. Now, if you notice where she's murdered is very secluded. Where the bridge is, is supposedly a lot of activity. And he claims this. Okay. He claims, um, does he claim it here? Hold on a second. Uh, okay. This is a place that he later claims there's a lot of noise from, but not so here at the moment. So they say, can you come to the precinct where we can talk to you and show you the max? All right. And he said, and they told him so many people from around the neighborhood come and helped us. Everyone is so pissed off about it that people are coming to help us all the time. Now, I have no idea if the police said this. This is, this is his writing. So anyway, he decided he would take, go in. He, he would he have to finish taking his dog for a walk and then he'd come in. Do us a favor. Really appreciate it. So according to him, although it's not any of the, any of the media stories, he was asked to come in because he was a regular dog walker in the park. And I don't know if they just ran over, ran into him or somebody said that guy's creepy. I don't know. I don't know any of the police reports before this point in time. I don't even know if what he's writing is true. He could be lying about how he ended up at the police station. He could have just wanted to go in the police station just to go into the police station. But according to him and Victor, <laughs> he was asked to come into the police station because of the things he said. So now he goes to the police station and now it gets more interesting. All right. So what does he say at the police station? Now, let me find it. All right. And this is where he got in into a wee bit of trouble becoming a major suspect. All right. So now he comes into the station and he says, Victor had painted himself into a corner, dipping his brush into the stagnant pool of lost weeks spent in Home Depot. <laughs> As I said, do not read this book. Okay, let's skip all of that because it's dreadful. Now, Victor, an unworkable uh, amalgam, ready to fall apart, meeting reality and recombine into someone who will make sense to himself. And the reason I'm showing you some of the ways he writes, he is not writing what is called word salad. Word salad is when somebody who is schizophrenic puts a whole bunch of words on a page, none of it makes any sense. I mean, they might make sense for like half a sentence and then it goes into something else that doesn't even connect. And it's a complete jumble of a uh, mishmash. His is not that way. His is, he, he, you can understand sort of what he's saying, but he exaggerates, he over-focuses, he over-focuses on himself. He, he goes into tangents that aren't necessary. 
um, mostly about himself and, and how the world is. And there's going to be a reason for this because we're going to find out later the other things that he does. Um, so anyway, so he goes in to the, into the police station. Now, they pointed at a chair for him to wait to help under a watchful glass rectangle. Is that a desk? <laughs> um, an inverted pupil positioned in the middle of a cement wall. On the table lay a map of Inwood Hill Park. He could hardly see the park's outline on the stillborn creation of an overworked copy machine. Oh, he thinks this is brilliant writing. That's why I couldn't get it. He, he did not get it. He did not get a publisher. Let me, let me just say that. He did not get a publisher. Studying familiar shapes, he was supposed to discover some of the past uh, official names. They probably ran out of ink. I can hardly pick anything out I recognize. So he gets up and he starts to pace, paying attention to the walls that were thickly buttered with battleship gray. The detectives returned and collapsed onto chairs. I didn't sit, they collapsed, you see. Their faces were sagging from overwork. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. A suit's creased in a thousand places, smelling of melted deodorant. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I thought I'd read it to you just because, you know, along with the hor horrifying parts of the story, <laughs> you just, you just, it's just hard to believe he writes this garbage. Okay, so now they talk about him knowing the park well. Like a dog walker, you know, somebody's always in the park. All right, I'm going to skip some of this. And da -da -da -da. Now... All right, so they talk about the bridge here. Uh, every time before bypassing it, Victor stopped in fascination to observe the pro progress of the bridge. So Victor, Dimitri, is saying that he is very well aware of this bridge and what is going on. Most of the work was done underneath, and he goes on describing the entire bridge. Um, all right, so he goes on with that. And then he said... Um, so Steve was visualizing the writing on the blackboard at the prep meetings. The scene of the crime is likely premeditated. So who do you think? Is it a local guy? He asks this kind of with, with, with a F word I won't put in. And he says it's a possibility. They talked to this matter for a few minutes. Steve was scrutinizing Victor on a lookout for the signs of being nervous, sweaty, and fake while displaying them him all himself. He said he only likes to watch world news. Let's cut to the chase. All right. Victor could not contain himself on his seat, and he, he was up gesticulating. He could vividly see the familiar path. But something other than that, just good understanding of the area's topography, was pulling him into the park. Pulling him into the park. His knowledge of the locality assisted him in visualizing the locality, this locality, helped him visualize a figure hiding in the undergrowth, crouching, ready to leap on a jogger. Everywhere along the path, the pavement was cracked. On the sides, uneven ch ch uh, chunks of asphalt were breaking off, mixing with rocks and twigs. The bridge loomed somewhere above. He probably, now this is come, this is Dimitri slash Victor. He says, he probably sprang up from the bushes and grabbed her in a chokehold. Victor proceeded to reenact the, the vision, showing the hold over the imagined victim. Maybe this way. All right. Uh, then, then tightening his arm he gave it a twist and if he is careful he want to move right out of sight so he probably rolled with her into the shrubs next to the road okay and then they asked what happened next i kept thinking he's really scared of getting caught so perhaps he also hit her in the ribs to quickly silence her did he break her ribs as a matter of fact i think he could have victor was looking into in slow motion at the fist, slamming into the woman's rib cage and experiencing sharp pain as she probably did. He's, he's getting, he's like, if the vision is taking over him. Now, I wanna point out something here. She had a broken rib, a couple broken ribs, and this was not given out to the public. This is what really brought their suspicion that he knew this, that she punched her in the rib location and had broken ribs. Now, mind you, the police did something wrong here, according to, Victor, which we don't know is even <laughs> telling the truth. But according to him, they said, after he said he punched her in the rib area, they said, did he break her ribs? 
That is a leading question. I don't like it when the police do this because it puts ideas in somebody's head and then they can just agree, which means that they may never have even had the concept that her ribs are broken and may not have known that because nobody did. And then you put that in his head and he goes, okay. So I am not overly convinced that he said because her ribs were broken that it came from his own head, could have come from the police. So this is problem. This is, this is, this is my opinion, bad interrogation, if this even happened. And I can't say that it did. All right. So now, now, okay, I got to find the next part of this. All right. So it, go, it goes on for quite a while, which I'm not going to put you through. Now, the next thing that got him in trouble was this. All right. Let me find this part. Okay. So now he says, okay, so Steve's face, that's the police, um, went red. He couldn't believe his luck. Victor was transported to the murder site, suspended from above, observing the nightmare unfolding below him, staring at Tara Wolf, a.k.a. Sarah Fox. Hovering over the crime scene in anger and disbelief was even stranger. Life was so quickly knocked out of her body that she had not yet fully comprehended what had happened. He shared every emotion she was feeling while simultaneously witnessing the murderer doing something over her corpse. The only thing Victor could recognize in the man was fear. Fear. This is a good point. Keep that in mind. Fear. Why would he imagine the guy had fear? Usually serial killers, rapists, sexual uh, guys committing a sexual murder don't feel fear they feel thrill why is he saying that person's feeling fear keep that in mind okay fear of what fear of being caught for the despicably weird thing that he's busy doing down in the bushes i'm going to say that that's not the moment the guy feels fear the fear usually comes for a serial killer after the fact after he's committed the crime then he's like oh crap i hope i don't get caught but if you feel fear during the crime why is that interesting all right so he goes on. Let's see. All right. So it goes on for a long time here because B is very wordy, <laughs> very wordy. Okay. So then the guy, they ask him if he, that if he had sex with her using the F word, which I'm not going to use here. I, and he says, Victor says, I don't think so. Which is interesting because almost always when you have a woman who's naked in a park who's been assaulted, she has been raped. I mean, that's that's what a serial killer does, and generally speaking. And she's she's naked, but not sexually assaulted. Why would Victor say this, a.k.a. Dimitri? Did he blank her? I don't think so. Victor heard his own voice sounded exhausted. Why not? Perhaps she had her period. He definitely is the one. Steve jumped up from his chair and glanced at Ricardo, who was rubbing his hands together, smiling. Then devouring Victor alive with his visual organs. <laughs> his visual organs. Eyes, 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 Victor, eyes. Um, he continued in a insinuating tone. Do you know that you are the only one beside the police department and the victim's relatives who knows that information? What exactly? Steve began to grin as well. A broken rib and a period. Did she did have a broken rib? She did. She had a period? She did. I was correct. So Victor now is super excited, Dimitri, uh, that he was so much he had, he had actually figured that out. And in his mind, what he saw was her clothes and a tampon sitting on top of things. Okay. Um, so I think that's, a, that's, that's where, okay, let's see here. Hold on a second. Okay, so that's, that's what he envisioned. A pile of clothes and a tampon on top. So he knew she was on a period, which is weird. Uh, the other thing he knew was that she supposedly had a branch between her legs. And the question was, did she use the branch? Did somebody use the branch to do something to her? And this is very interesting to me because, first of all, he shouldn't have known a branch was between her legs. He could have guessed that. Maybe somebody insinuated that. I don't know. But why is, But he apparently knew that a branch was between her legs. So, but he did not say that the, the necessarily the branch was used to insert, okay, as opposed to being raped. He did that. The, the killer did that. But I think there's another reason for the branch between her legs, which I'm also going to get into. All right. So now what's interesting here is says, Victor, please enlighten us how you are so well informed. 
Okay. Cause now they're like, okay, dude, you know, way too much. You know, the area of this park, you're creepy dude. You know, you're out there with your dog. You know too much about the crime scene. She also said the reason the guy picked this area was because if she screamed, it wouldn't be heard over the noise of the bridge being built. So that's another thing he said. So he's got too much knowledge of something he shouldn't have knowledge of. And he's come in and he said, this is coming to him as he's talking. So they said, how are you so well informed? Victor had hardly even paid attention to the subject, but knew enough to be aware that psychics work for police the world over. Finally, everything made wonderful sense. What can I say? I must be psychic. <laughs> Which I think is fascinating. So he's in there. They've got him in there. He knows too much. He didn't come in saying he was a psychic. Okay. And believe me, I, if anybody knows me, I'm not fond of psychic stuff. I find psychic a con job. And if you're one of the people watching the show that says, oh, no, I'm a real psychic. Okay, isn't that sweet? Um, <laughs> bless your heart, as they say in the song. Bless your heart, you think you're a psychic. I'm going to say you got issues. All right, uh, and I'm going to lose a whole bunch of people from just saying that. But I don't care what you do in your own time. I don't care if, 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 you, if you do psychic stuff within your family, with friends, as long as you don't charge any money for it with people that aren't involved in crimes. If you're not going out there in the world like... <laughs> so many of these creepy psychics on TV who claim they're psychic and make millions of dollars misleading people saying they're talking to the dead loved ones and that they know what happened at the crime scene pisses me off really badly. So I don't want to get into that here because I will go on a soapbox, but, and I don't care. And it's funny because I know I do believe to an extent in meditation where if you meditate, you get certain, you can, you can meditate and, you know, see things and, and get, quote, messages, maybe from your own brain, maybe from afar. I don't care. If you're meditating, that's fine with me. I don't care because that's why people meditate so they can get some kind of spiritual input. I'm okay with that. But when you start saying you're a psychic and know what happened at a crime scene, I'm going to say you're a con artist or you're the killer. Those are the two you get a choice of. Okay. But what's interesting is he didn't come in saying he was a psychic. Usually that's what happens. Somebody, I've had God knows how many people contact me and say, I know where Chandra Levy was. That was the funniest thing. That was one of my biggest points that I had dozens of people uh, say they were psychics. And Sa Chandra Levy was in, in, in a well. Chandra Levy was uh, in the mountains. Chandra Levy was here. Chandra Levy was there. And not one of them guessed Rock Creek Park. You know why? Because they're phony. Okay. So there you go. Um, this guy didn't come in saying I'm a psychic, which is interesting. Why not? Because if that's what he was if that's what he knew he was and he was going to come in here to be a psychic to the police and now he's realizing oh yeah you know psychics do come and talk to the police so i'm going to claim that he didn't claim it when he came in he discovered it after he was there isn't that amazing okay let me read a little more what he says okay so he's <laughs> so he goes all right let me find it okay hold on a second Oh, okay. So I must be psychic. A, a who? A psychic suspect? Concerned at the unexpected turn of events, Steve sat down slumping behind the table. He thought a cup of coffee and a smoke while having to quickly adjust to the shift in the situation, hopeful that Victor was referring to himself as a psychic was a sort of admission to being a psycho. Psychic or psycho? I didn't actually get the name of my show from that, but here it is. I, I hadn't read this before. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Okay. Um, uh, I'm taking a long time to find this because it's a very tiny little writing here. Okay, where am I at here? Uh, okay, a psychic suspect. All right. All it is is a couple of letters. That's my feeling, you know, psychic to psycho. Uh, gut feeling. However, it's an obvious complication. The bastard is attempting to riddle out of this one. It is a shame that, a, that as of this moment, Mr. Scheinman can simply walk out of here as if so he wishes. Be patient, concentrate. He must be eased into revealing his guilt since that is what the freaking really freak really wants. He's staring at Victor with disgust, forgetting to make any effort to hide it. What do you mean, psychic Victor? You know, my mother was psychic. She called me one night telling me where I kept my smokes. Can you believe it? She told me to go into my office, open the third metal shelf from the top and throw them out. Kept me off, off the damn things for a month or so. So then the guy says, if you're a psychic, then tell us who killed Tara. Okay, Sarah. 
That was Ricardo pointedly interjecting his comment into the background, uh, who, of course, shared Steve's thoughts, blah, blah, blah. Well, I never, I was, hmm, okay, so anyway, Sage very Psychic used to say, be able to do that. All right, so, and it goes on. I'm not going to go into the rest of the crap. So anyway, this is how the psychic thing came up. It wasn't because he walked into the office saying he was a psychic. It was because he walked into the office and knew too much and then went to psychicness to cover what he had just said. Isn't that interesting? All right, so. Now what happens with, with this character? All right, so they suspect the heck out of him, but they've got zero DNA evidence. So he walks out of the office and they can't do anything because they cannot connect him physically with the crime scene. They definitely have what's considered a sort of confession. But the problem is you have a lot of people falsely confess. And the same thing happens with psychics. If, you, if, if, if enough psychics contact me, let me put it this way. Let's say... I, there was another girl that was uh, killed. I don't know. They got that one wrong too. Okay. But, you know, if so, some psychics are good profilers. I'll give them credit on that one. Sometimes what they can do is analyze a crime like I do and come up with what's most reasonable. Then they contact you. And instead of saying, hey, look, I analyzed the crime. This is what I came up with. They go, I'm psychic. I don't know anything about the crime. I don't know anything about the area. But the body will be found next to a barn. And then when a body's found next to a barn, you go, oh, my God, they knew something. Well, like the clock that's right, the, the, the stop clock that's right twice a day. If you have 200 psychics, a couple of them might actually be right because they're guessing and you can sometimes guess correctly. So they didn't know if this Looney Tomb was guessing and just guessed enough correctly. But guessing she's on her period. That was probably the thing that really threw them. They're like, that would not be somebody would normally say when it was actually true. Um, and they had, he had the stick and he had um, the broken rib. Three things. The broken rib, they, they gave him too much information. So I'm going to toss that. The stick between the legs is interesting that he would have any clue on that. The period is very interesting. Um, so what happens now? So anyway, he walks away because they, they don't have anything to actually prove he did anything. So he, so he, he uh, moves to South Africa with his family and... Um, while he's there, he decides he's going to write this book, this absolutely god-awful book. And so he comes back to the U.S. and he wants to meet with the police. And what he's saying now is he's back in there and he says, I won't meet you at the police station. He's got these envelopes in his hand. Uh, I won't meet you at the police station. I'll only meet you in a public place. Because now he's trying to get media publicity because he's a, he's a media hound. So that's another issue. Is the guy just a media freak and just wants attention or did he really do something? There is always the problem when people confess to things or even allude to confessing. So now he's got these, he got this, this um, envelopes. He meets the police in a public place. And in the envelope is the name of a guy he thinks did it that other psychics helped him with. And it turns out the guy wasn't even in the country at the time. So it was a bunch of garbage, but he was trying to promote his book. And then he went away. Um, now, now he's back in South Africa. And let me show you some of his website, and I'm going to tell you what my analysis is um, about, do I think he could have done it or do I think he's just an attention seeker? All right. So this website that he had, the Shineman source, he has some very interesting things on this website since he went to South Africa. Here's a comment. I don't do anything because I'm nice. I'm not nice. Shyman told the post, I see healing. He, oh, oh, let me tell you, he's doing his healing crap. Okay, so let me find that thing. Uh, okay, oh, he does this. Okay, healing practices. He does sessions over his cell phone. I guess that heals you. Okay, uh, sessions in person, does massages. Techniques from the humanoid matrix. Okay, the way of the Messiah. We're going to get to the Messiah issue in a minute. Oh, my, uh, a medicine. I don't even know what some of this crap is. Okay. He's into healing now, you see. He's got a new he's got a new program going. All right. So he says this. What did I just do with it? Where'd it go? Hold on a second. Oh, there. No, no, that's not it. Where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Okay. So now he's doing healing. But I, I'm doing not he's not doing healing because he's nice. He says I'm not nice. I see healing as a selfish activity. Well, at least he's got some insight because it makes me feel good. 
Oh, that's always a nice thing. I have no choice but to heal. It is what's been chosen for me. Who chose it? Who chose it for him? I'm going to say he chose it for him. All right. Because you can make a lot of money off of cho choosing healing because a whole lot of people will fall for this crap that he's going to say. If you say a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo and you tell people, people you're going to heal them, <sighs> lots of people are desperate. They want to be healed from all the pain in their life. And I don't, I understand that people suffer a lot in their lives. And as they go through life, they just want comfort. And here comes a guy who's slick talking, who says he's able to do these things. And it's that kind of, you know, okay, I'm willing to give it a shot. And, and he makes me feel like he cares, even if he is a con artist. <laughs> but I don't know it as a con artist. I know. Okay. Uh, so I have no choice but to heal. Otherwise, I probably have to hurt people. Wait a minute. Let's look at that again. I have no choice but to heal. Otherwise, I'd probably hurt people. I have never said that in my life. Like I have to do, I have to do profiling. Otherwise I'd hurt people. I have to take care of my children because otherwise I'd hurt people. <laughs> I have to do sign language interpreting because I used to be an interpreter because otherwise I'd kill people. No, <laughs> Why would I say that? Why does he say he would hurt people who doesn't heal? Why does he just do a regular job and go home to his family and, and, and play games? I mean, you know, he would hurt people. That's an interesting thing he says. Okay. All right, let's look at some else, other things he says. This is, to me, the most interesting of all. He starts an entirely new, he's starting a new group. He thought he was going to be a new um, Jim Jones. <laughs> That's all I can say. The dude wants to be Jim Jones. Let's see what he says. The power. He's, the group is called The Power. He's going to start The Power. You see, don't just read the Bible, not just uh, whatever else your religion might be. Don't do those things. <laughs> you need the power. All right. What is the power? It starts out with a rape and murder of a woman. I thought he said she wasn't raped, but okay. Um, and the way a man who tried to help was wrongfully dealt with marks the birth of a new religion. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sarah Fox. By the way, he says she talks to him now. He has a picture of it her underneath the glass on his desk and he sees her when he comes into the room and she they, she tells she tells him that she loves him and that he's her savior and she's gonna she's he's the one's gonna solve this crime and and so he talks to her all the time yes he does and so sarah fox the murder of sarah fox is the thing that inspired the new religion all right the birth of a new religion the power which exalts thinking on your own to a status of a prayer it had to be that way what else to get fired about, up about? How about getting incensed over mindless repetition? That would be your book. Um, because the murder and rape of this woman represents every murder and every rape. Okay. Okay. Victor. Not Dimitri. Victor. Is claiming. Claiming. Now, mind you, he's writing this himself. Now, somebody else, if I were writing this, I might say the guy who calls himself Victor is claiming. <laughs> he's actually third personing himself and saying he's claiming, not that he is. That is fascinating. Victor is claiming to be the one who is the Messiah of this world and the leader of the great new religion. He's the new Jesus Christ. He is... He's got a Messiah complex. And so let me stop here and tell you what a Messiah complex is. Let me read to you about what a Messiah complex is, which, which again is fascinating. Let me find the Messiah complex. Mm -hmm. One second. Um, I want to read you from a, a source at least. Oh, of course, Wikipedia now. <laughs> okay. It's easy. You know. Okay, a Messiah complex, Christ complex, or Savior complex is a state of mind in which an individual holds a belief that they are destined to become a Savior today or in the near future. This term can also be referred to a state of mind in which an individual believes they are responsible for saving or assisting others. Now, he is saying here that he is the, the new Jesus Christ. He is saying that. A victor is. Okay. And so he's going to save everybody in the world. But he's all, he's, he thinks he's responsible for saving or assisting others. Now, it's interesting. If you look back to the crime, he also tells the police that he saved somebody else. 
He saved somebody. There was a girl who collapsed and supposedly he, he saved her life. Another jogger. I don't know if there's any truth to that story, but that's what he claims. And now, of course, he's saving uh, Sarah Fox by the fact that he goes, talks to the police and tells what happened so they can find the killer. So you see, he's assisting. He's assisting in the murder of Sarah Fox. So is this a delusionary thing he has in general? So he has nothing to do with the crime. He's just so freaking delusional that he's always thinking he's doing these things, you know, in his own mind, mind you, in his own mind, because people aren't taking him real seriously. Because the power that he started collapsed and crashed and it got nowhere. His book got nowhere. Um, nothing he's done has gotten anywhere, particularly. I think, I don't know how he survives. I don't know if his wife supports him. I don't know. But anyway, let's go further. All right. Victor is claiming, claiming to be the one who is the Messiah of this world and the leader of the great new religion, the power, which is the only true religion besides Satanism. <laughs> That's an interesting concept. All right. That there is because the truth is one and the power is congruent with the universal principles of morality, which he doesn't apparently have. Um, which all humanoids dispersed far and wide throughout their multi-dimensional universe know innately. Mm -hmm. Victor is claiming it. That, that claim is a lot, but he doesn't know. Claiming to be the one who is the choice provider of this world so that evil has their high quality food to continue perpetuating this reality and the higher forces of expansion can build other dimensions using highly vibrational energy as some souls produce in the form of honesty and courage as they vibrate right out of this nightmarish world toward complexity. Remember the sacred intent of the soul is to rise. As you can see, there are many messiahs who can bring people along with them because they're very smooth talkers. This ain't one of them. So you can't get any disciples. <laughs> Guy cannot. <laughs> he sucks as a Messiah. He's terrible. He's a rotten Messiah. So it's only in his own delusional head that he believes this. Now you say, then what kind of guy is he? Is he psychotic? I haven't heard him say outside of his vision of the crime that he hears voices or any of this kind of stuff. Is he delusional? He's in his own mind. He believes he's way more than he is. Um, so some people will say it's his bipolar disorder. Some people will say it's a psychopathy to have this kind of stuff going on in their head. I do not see any schizophrenia in his history. So I'm going to lean toward, you know, more of the, the Jim Jonesy thing where you develop in your own head that you have this ability because it makes you somebody, you have grandiose thinking, which is a psychopathic um, grandiose think thinking. And therefore you're a super important dude. Now here's where it comes down to, let me get to the crime here and then I'll go to your comments. All right. So the question would be, is it possible he killed Sarah Fox? Did, did he just guess right and was just an attention seeker or did he actually describe the crime scene because he committed the crime? Here is my theory. Now, mind you again, I do not have inside information on this crime. I do not have the police reports, the autopsy reports, crime scene stuff. I don't have any of that. But here is what I think is a possibility and it is not necessarily so. I'm not saying this guy's guilty of anything outside of being a terrible writer. Go back to painting. Your painting wasn't bad. <laughs> Go back to painting. You're a terrible writer and stop trying to be a savior and the Messiah because nobody's following you. So taking those things away from him, uh, he may be delusional and he may have talked himself into being a suspect. I'm not saying he committed the crime, but here's what I do see that is very possible in my opinion. Sarah Fox, normally when you find a woman who is raped and murdered, I mean, she wasn't necessarily raped. He starts claiming she's raped, but I think he, I think that's part of staging. I'll explain staging in a minute. She was found, she went jogging and ends up dead in the park. Now, sometimes when you, when you, if it had been truly ritualistic with flowers put around her and all that stuff, I might've said, Hey, she had a stalker, but at the flowers, I don't buy that. But yet I think this, the, the, I do think it was staged. Her clothes were not there. Okay. And there's a stick between, supposedly between her legs. I don't know about the rest of it. Stick between her legs. 
I think it sounds more like to me that it is possible this guy doesn't keep his dog on a leash. He walks around the park and he gets in confrontations with people and his dog scares the living crap out of people. Sarah's running along and suddenly out of nowhere, this dog comes after her. And I've had this happen. I have had this happen in parks. So I can totally relate to this. Um, I had a, um, uh, oh shoot, the, uh, what's it called? Um, Mastiff. I was walking down the path with my husband. We we're walking down the path and this Mastiff came running straight at me down the path, a mastiff. And it is massive. It's huge. I think it was bigger than me. And it came at me. It jumped on me, put its, it jumped up, put its paws down on my shoulders. I looked up and that sucker knocked me straight to the ground. And do you know what those people said? Oh, he's friendly. <laughs> Same thing. This guy always claims his dog is, oh, it's friendly. It's just a, it's just a puppy. I'm like, that puppy just knocked me to the ground. I was pissed. Because it could have, it could have hurt me. Now you know it could have hurt me badly. Um, and it turned out when I got back up, the thing just licked me. But the problem is, it still knocked me to the ground. And it could have. I have also been attacked in a park by a little dog, and that little dog did bite my leg. And it was kind of scary because the, the guy didn't have the dog on the leash, and the dog came up and bite me. I was on a bike path going around. Everybody was on the path. There was a little child behind me. If that dog had bitten, not bitten my leg, but bitten that child, it would have bit the child right in the face. And after the dog did that, the guy grabbed his dog and ran like hell. I chased that sucker. He managed to get in his car and get out before he could get the license plate. So, yes, this happens in parks. People with their dogs. Actually, that second dog was on a leash, but it was such a long leash that the dog attacked me anyway. <laughs> so, she, so she's jogging. And all of a sudden, this guy who leaves his dog off the leash, who scares the crap out of people with his dog, the dog comes at, I don't know, the dog jumped her or the dog just came near her. It could have been anything. She freaks out. Now, what did he do to the other guy? He punched that guy and knocked him out. What happens if she's alone with this guy and the dog and she freaks out and she yells at him, oh, my God, your dog did it. And he gets angry and he punches her or he grabs her and he kills her. Maybe not planning to kill her, but in his rage, because he does have rage problems, apparently with other people that he ends up killing her. And now he's got a dead woman on the side of the trail and he decides to, what, what is it advantageous is at that point to stage a crime that looks like a serial homicide, to remove her clothing, to pose her, not ritualistic, to pose her in a way that, oh, this looks sexual, and then run away. So therefore they're looking for a serial killer. They're not looking for the guy with that dog. You know, that might be running through his little demented mind because his mind is a little strange. Uh, so in my opinion, the most likely thing, according to his story, is that he did that. And the reason he would know that she was on her period, because when he's removing her clothes, he finds that she's on her period. And that to him is, you know, it's noticeable to him. Um, if he, uh, I, and it, it, it is questionable whether it's possible that that stick was used to insert in her in order to make it look like a rape. He wasn't actually going to rape her, but he did that to make it look like a rape. It's possible. So in my opinion, it's possible this is a crime of anger that was staged as a sexual homicide to take. So because he's just the guy with the dog. Um, is this what happened? I do not know. But I can say this. It's awful strange that he knows things he shouldn't know. And um, yes, he does a messiah complex. So maybe he just wanted to be important and say he could see all this, but he didn't come up. He didn't know he was psychic till that moment <laughs> until he got into a position where he thought, maybe I better say I'm psychic because I've just given up too much information. So do I think he's likely the guy who did it? I think he should still be their top suspect, but I do not know if he did it, but I would say uh, they haven't, had, you know, uh, there hasn't been other noticeable. Uh, there has been, there have been a couple other crimes late lately in the park. A woman attacked, but again, it's a huge park. And at some point, some other rapist and serial killer will roll through that park. Um, but he's an awfully good suspect. It's hard to look away from him. He shouldn't have known what he'd known. Uh, his stories are strange. Um, but I, I do not personally, I think if he committed the crime, it wasn't a sexual homicide. I believe it would have been a crime of rage that he tried to stage as something else um, so that it would look like they'd be looking for a serial killer and not a, a dog walker because he was already known to be a annoying dog walker. 
<laughs> and you have to understand it's in, if, if he did it, it's in his mind, not our minds. We might think, well, wouldn't you want to just not have it look like a serial killer? Because would maybe they come back and think you're a serial killer. Yeah, you can think that, but you know, it's his mind and how he works. And he said, thinks, okay, well, by, by stages to look like that, then they won't suspect me because I'm just a dog walker. But if it looks like I, she got just, just killed in a rage, Maybe they would suspect me. So it's hard to know what goes on in his mind because his mind is messed up. I'm sorry, guy. You just, you know, you need, you could use some help <laughs> and don't write anymore. Um, but, um, but that's, that's the, that to me is the most likely scenario that I can come up with. Uh, could it have been a serial killer? If it, if it was actually a sexual homicide, then it would be a serial killer. Could he have committed a sexual homicide? It's possible. I don't see it in him. I really don't. It's, it's, you know, sometimes I'll say, well, you know, that guy could clearly could be a serial killer and committed other serial crimes. I don't see it. I see him as delusional as far as him thinking he's better than everybody else in the world and uh, just being able to break the rules and to you know, all the stuff he's gotten into with being a messiah and stuff. I see that as a very different kind of person than a serial killer. Um, so I just don't, I believe if he committed the crime, it wasn't a sexual homicide. It was a rage crime. A stage is a sexual homicide. Um, so that's my thoughts on that. And I'm going to get to your comments now. Let's see what y'all have to say. All right. So 270 comments. <laughs> I don't know. I can get all those in. Whew. Oh my goodness gracious. Let me, maybe I'll start at the bottom. Um, somebody said, Sarah Adams, your brain is a very scary place, hon. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and look at that. By the way, if you're still here at the end of this show, please do uh, subscribe to the channel, like the video. And uh, keep us keep me going here because uh, I've got a lot more work to do with this channel and uh, especially the school part that I'm it's coming, guys. I know you've been waiting for the school part, which I'm going to do all the different um, uh, subjects of profiling. It's going to be an online profiling school with short segments uh, on different issues. Uh, but I've got I've got some of it set up, but it, it's taking a while. So I know you, you're interested in that, but um, I'm getting to it. I, I'm getting to it. Um, uh Pat, did he also tell police things that weren't true? Marie, that's a great question. I, I don't have, again, the police interview, uh, which I did. wish I had that. Um, all I've got is his version. Uh, I don't see that he told him anything that wasn't true. So that's kind of interesting. I, but that's a good, that is a good question, because if you, if you throw out 50 things and 47 of them are stupid you know, and completely wrong, and three are right, then it's more questionable. But if he gets almost everything right, then you're like a little more suspicious, a little more suspicious. Interestingly enough, they did come out and say he is their top suspect. They say he's still their top suspect. They they haven't shied away from that, which sometimes when the guy's like, they, that's how people confess to crimes all the time. And, and they usually just, they amazingly, they just, they like the attention. They come in and confess. Um, most time, that's not them they don't seem to be backing off of this guy. Um, uh, police have nothing on him. They don't have physical evidence, Lisa. That's a, the DNA does not exist. And that's the problem. If he didn't rape her, maybe no DNA. There was also six, uh, six days of rain, wind, um, decomposition. So they just got uh, things out in nature. Don't go so well sometimes. And when there's no rape, there may be no, no DNA secluded inside her body, but then you go, okay, well, you know, her body's highly decomposed, but there is DNA somewhere inside her body in a location which, you know, kept it safe. Apparently there isn't. Therefore, there's no proof of rape or sexual assault. And so there's no DNA, which is unfortunate. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Pat? Pat hates Marilyn Mosby, Jose by a psychopath, and what are poopies? <laughs> what are poopies? I hate puppies. <laughs> I don't hate puppies. I, yeah, the rest of them, yes, that's true. Puppies, I don't dislike puppies. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> I like puppies. I just don't want them peeing on myself. I like the one that comes into my house um, from next door. <laughs> what? I got to find out about the puppies. <laughs> Nobody's going to like me if you say I don't like puppies. I mean. I love puppies. I love kittens. I had cats. I've had pigs. I've had all kinds of animals. Big puppers. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Big puppers. What? 
I don't think Pat appreciated that puppy. What puppy are we talking about? Now I have no idea what you're talking about. We, we, our family has two German Shepherds and a cockapoo. We have a cockapoo. Not me. I had the, Ziggy the cat where Ziggy died. So they're next door to me. And uh, they do try to run in my house. Mac, Max, which is the cockapoo, did run in my house. I was really excited and peed on my couch, which did upset me. But I still love the puppy. Who says I don't like puppies? What kind of person doesn't like puppies? Wait a minute. <laughs> Somebody better explain that to me. I'm turning out to be a horrible human being now. Oh, my God. <laughs> puppies. Oh, no. You're talking about the dog attacked you. Oh, I've been, yeah. so, so I had, yeah, I've had, I've been attacked three times by dogs. No, four times. I've had bad luck with dogs. I mean, dogs, it's weird because dogs really love me. I'm one of those people that I come in the room and the dogs just adore me. But I, when I was a child, uh, two, two dogs attacked me when I was running and they ripped my little red jacket and they ripped the pocket out. And I was walking through a woods because I was only like, I think I was nine years old. And, you know, those days we used to run through the woods in dangerous places. And these two dogs attacked me and knocked me down and ripped my little jacket. Um, we, and that, so that was my first one. Second one, I was doing some invest, uh, doing something going door to door. And I, somebody opened the door and said, no worries, they're, they're, they're harmless. And then the two dogs jumped me. And they went, okay, never mind. They pulled the dogs off me. They were big dogs. I think they were Dobermans. And then then I had the two, 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 two park things. So... Yeah, I don't hold it against all dogs and puppies. <laughs> She's gonna freak out. I'm gonna freak out. Uh oh. That's why she's confused and offended. Anybody who knows me knows I don't easily get offended. But I will defend myself on occasions, but I usually get offended very easily. But I do get my attention. I'm like, I don't like puppies. Oh my god. Oh, <laughs> I'm reading the comments out of order. Okay, I shouldn't start at the bottom. There were 200 and whatever comments. I can't, I'm trying, I have to go. Okay, I'm going to go back up. Find out why I've been accused of not liking poopies. <laughs> no, wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute. There's a rabbit hole here. Hold on a second. Let me go back up. Okay. There were so many comments during all the time. Y'all were having some fun over here, and I, and I don't quite know what happened. But let me let me try to go up here. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Okay. So we had a great show here in Denmark, a mentalist, he calls himself. He does things that really seem like he's reading people's minds, but he explains how he does that. Yes. And, and the, the television show, The Mentalist with Patrick in it, he says, oh, I mean, it's, a, it's all a con, but he's really a very good profiler. And a lot of mentalists are good profilers. What people call psychic stuff is very good profiles and people who are good at cold reading and they, they know how to throw out little teeny pieces of information and get somebody to give up enough to then move to come up with some more stuff. So it's a clever magic trick is what it is. And as long as if you go to a show uh, and you accept it's magic, you don't feel like you're being con because, you know, it's magic. And I do love a great I just went to a great magic show with my granddaughter and my daughter. It was absolutely fabulous. And we had such a good time. Now, we all knew it was the girl was not being sawn in half. You know what I mean, we knew that uh, we knew things weren't happening that we were seeing happening because we knew it was a trick. And we enjoyed the fact that we were being fooled. The problem with so many psychics is that people actually believe that they're being told the truth. And that just hurts my heart. Um, when I see that scuzzy dude that does. Oh, he's on. He's, he's real popular. And I forgot his name. Um, he's making millions now and he's like the celebrity, celebrity psychic now. Um, and he's telling people he's always contacting their loved ones and stuff from, from beyond the grave. And just it hurts me because he's not doing it. And these people are believing he's doing it. Now, hey, I don't care if you want to pray or meditate and try to reach the loved one you have that's no longer there. I think that's fine. You know, I do believe in the level of meditation, which sometimes you get information, which is 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 valuable. I, I'm not against that prayer that brings you comfort. I have a problem when somebody else who doesn't know you plays you and lies to you, and you buy it, and and it's and and it's just, just I, maybe it does bring comfort to people, but I, I think being comforted by lies is not right. You're a con artist, and nobody should be praising you, and no television program should be praising you. You should be drummed out of town. If you're a con artist, but yeah, if you're if you're putting on a show and you're like, okay, this is this is a show, I'm being a mentalist, no, I'm fooling you, and then we play the game. I'm I'm good with that. I don't have a problem with that at all. 
Uh, not at all, because that's an honest person. And they're doing some. Uh... Yes, um, this is true. Sarah says, I think it's about people having great intuition. Very true. Knowing how to read people. Very true. And good at deductive reasoning. Very true. Um, yes. But I shouldn't say that they're psychic because they're not. That's the problem I have because they're lying about that aspect of it. Oh, God, help us, Miss Cleo. Man, she around. And sent, what's, what's her name? Uh, Brown. Sandra Brown? The one who was on uh, um, Montel Williams. It was the one time I was pissed off about. I used to do a lot of Montel Williams shows. And I'm like, Montel, why do you have this con artist on your show? You know, it, 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 you know you're doing, he did so many good shows on missing persons and murdered children and all that. Uh, so many good things on that. And then he had this con artist on. Just really ticked me off. Really ticked me off. Um, why is he talking about periods? Uh, well, because he claims that that's why maybe she wasn't raped because she was having her period, you see. But why would you say that? First of all, if you if you're even if you're analyzing, you could easily say she was raped. But he actually said that. And it's kind of creepy. And also maybe he knows too much. So um, oh, he's got a wife. Sarah, <laughs> he's got a wife and is it, you know, he's not, he's not 10 years old. So I'm sure he knows tampons are around. Um, I don't know if she was wearing a tampon. I don't know that. I know she had a tampon. I don't they, apparently she was on a period. I don't know if she was using a pad or a tampon. I don't know, but he's creepy. Um, you can't lock up somebody on that. That's the problem. You know, you can, you can think that is too strange and you shouldn't know these things. And you're creepy, but you can't you can't take that to you cannot take that to trial. The prosecutor's going, huh, I'm not touching that. You better come up with something else that puts him at the crime scene in some way, shape, or form. If you go back to his house and you find that her clothing is in his house, you got something. Uh, if you got his DNA, if you've got anything, but they didn't have anything but this strange, this strange this uh, claims that he was making. Um, uh, what are the odds he knew about that branch if he didn't commit the crime? They had to be low. Yes, you would think. Because um, saying there was a branch placed between her legs aiming toward her body would be an unusual thing to know or to visualize. Um, clearly, she's in the woods. There's probably branches all around. Now, it is also possible that the branch fell during some windstorm. There's a small branch fell between her legs and had nothing to do with the crime at all. Same with the flower crap. Um, that's the problem. Some of the stuff we just don't know. Interestingly, he didn't go into the flower stuff right away. So maybe because it, when he was there, the flowers weren't. I find that interesting. Um, um, I, I don't know what that I really I don't know the details of him saying things that are wrong. Um, that I don't know. Um <laughs> Oh, no, that happens all the time. <laughs> they, they love me for 30 shows, and then I say something, and they're like, oh, I don't like you anymore. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, you know, it's okay. I mean, people have people have to go where they're comfortable. Um, and if they become uncomfortable with me because they, they think something I say is something I cannot agree with, and they can't put that aside and say, okay, the other stuff is, is really useful and educational to me. This, I just don't agree with this. That's why I try to say there's people out there who have channels. Who I don't agree with everything they say. Uh, I'll say I'm completely disagree with this, but I don't throw them out because I think they have other valuable things to offer because I don't personally, I don't want to be the only one out here offering education <laughs> because I think when we get like that, we think we can't learn from more than one person. We have to have a total guru that's not healthy. We should be able to read many sources, look at many things. Now we may get to a point where we say these sources, I'm not fond of these. I mean, I, and I do have, I do have strong issues about a lot of the FBI stuff that comes out. I do. Um, I'm not fond of John Douglas books. I'm not, I, but, but I'm not. An, uh, there are books that are put out by FBI profiles. I do like portions of, um, and some are very useful. Uh, I would say my favorite one is uh, the one with Bird. Okay, I'm just drawing a blank now. Burgess and Douglas and uh, they, they, it's one where they categorize people in different groups. But And I don't agree with all those groups, but I think it's interesting. Um, God, I blanked on that. What is it? I have the book right there. But um, 
I, but I find the studies interesting because sometimes we do studies to learn. And in the long run, we, I may disagree with a portion of those studies or even the results, but it doesn't mean everything is not interesting. Uh, there are a lot of interviews with serial killers that the FBI has done. And we can see that on the television show, uh, Mind, Mindhunter, which I think is better than the book because uh, it's really well done. Uh, but, and you can learn a lot from watching the real interviews, even though I think that sometimes I think we shouldn't have allowed that. And and I know they're lying a lot of times. They're, they're manipulating and lying and they're pathological liars. So I don't think you can take everything they say as credible. What concerns me is that when the FBI took a lot of this stuff as credible, then they built a database saying this is how things work when I don't think it's true. Uh, for example, one of the concepts was if a guy um, like covers a person with a covers up the victim, that means that he feels bad about the crime. I'm like, where'd you get that crap from? <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> you know, is that really why they did it? So I'm I'm concerned about jumping conclusions. But it doesn't mean I don't have some appreciation of the work that was done. I mean, I hope the same thing is true about me. That, I mean, I've looked back at some of my books and I'm like, I like 80% of my book and the other 20% I'm not so thrilled about. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I wrote that 20 years ago. You know, I've learned more. Um, not saying you shouldn't buy my books, but no. Uh, but, you know, everybody has something to offer. It's just sometimes I, you know, there's certain people I let, I do not, I'm not as thrilled about as others. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't read their stuff. But just because Pat Brown says, as you know, you shouldn't take a look at it. You should be open to being willing to educate yourself. When, when I studied profiling, I read 400 plus books. I read everybody's book I could get my hands on. Some I found more useful in the long run than others. Some I disagree with terribly, but I still learn from them. So, you know, I just think that people need to, to be more willing to educate themselves. Um, let's see. Uh, you run. I know I'm coming back down. So I still haven't figured out the cat thing. I mean, the doggy, the puppy thing. I still miss that one. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody's going to have to explain that one to me. They will. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm missing out, obviously, some people. Uh, I obviously, have had a more bigger discussion here than I can possibly keep up with. Um, so I'm just looking for major things on profiling and the crime that I can comment on rather than... Uh, Lots of good humorous stuff that's going on between you guys. Um, so I am trying. Oh, Lord, the abyss. Oh, <laughs> stare into the abyss. Oh, I don't, uh, uh, but let me just to mention the abyss thing. That that is that has been done by two profilers. One is Don Douglas, and the other one is a South African profiler. And I'm like, boy, you are over exaggerating. Because if you if you're so if your, your emotions are so that you're staring into this abyss of darkness and it's destroying your you're in the wrong business, you know, because serial killers, killers aren't that interesting in that way that, I can, you know, I have to connect with their minds and get all bent, bent out of shape about it. No, their minds are not that thrilling. Uh, they're quite mundane, actually, and, 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 and sad um, and just uh, unfortunate and. You know, that's not an, I don't fall into any abyss. <laughs> Say in the wrong business if that's what gets to you. Um, oh, if he killed her though, wouldn't that be hard to do with the dog? Why? Why? It's his dog. It's not her dog. It's his dog. He could have killed her and the dog could have helped. I don't know. The dog could have run around. It's, uh, the dog could have attacked her. We don't know the dog did not attack her either. The dog could have jumped on her and scrapped her, could have scratched her, could have, she could have fought, it could have bit her. Maybe it wasn't such a well-behaved little puppy, you know? I don't know. And then he killed the woman because the evidence of the dog attacking her was there. I think something went wrong with a rage attack, but the dog may have been involved, but it wasn't her dog. No, it wasn't her dog. It was his dog. So... <laughs> Who builds religion on the rape and murder of a woman? <laughs> a disturbed mind. That, that, that's what I would call a disturbed mind. A disturbed mind. Um, oh, is that the pattern? I didn't appreciate that puppy. <laughs> okay. Oh, Lord. Uh, <laughs> I didn't appreciate my cat, Ziggy. Ziggy was a terrible cat. Anybody who knows me, 17 years of that terrible cat. Ziggy was my, he would live with me for so long. He was such a terrible, evil cat, <laughs> but I still miss him. He died about three months ago and three months now, two months. 
um, old age, uh, but he, yeah, I still miss him. You know, he, he did sit in my lap and snuggle with me and try to rip my face off, but you know, he's still my cat. <laughs> oh my God. Um, let's see. Could he, could he have stumbled upon the body after the murder at some point? Probably not because she was down, down, down an area where he should not have been at. If you're walking along the path, no, and you didn't say my dog found the body. I, I'm not going to buy that one. I, I don't think so. But that is a that's a reasonable thought, though, because dog, as I said, dog walkers are usually ones that find bodies. So he could have found her body, but then you would think he just called the police and said, "I found this body." Okay, so could he have found the body and decided rather than call the police, he should be clever about it and be that this would allow him to be. This would allow him to be. A cool psychic? Yeah, that, that's that's not a bad thought. Let's see. So he finds the body. He would have to remove to take the clothing with him. And and the tampon, if there is one, or pad or something. You'd have to uh, and, and it depends when he found the body, how to decompose it was. He want to play around with taking clothes off the body or the clothes are sitting by. He said the clothes are like folded up nicely <laughs> in his brain. I'm like, is it possible? Yes. And that's what defense attorney might come up with that story. Uh, I don't think it's likely, but he is so delusional and he likes to help people and he likes to be the Messiah. Could he have done that to get himself attention? I found the body, but rather than just tell the police, I will just, but you see, supposedly he didn't go into the police on his own volition. Supposedly the, he claims in his own book, the police stopped him and talked to him, told him to come in essentially. He was forced in. And then he didn't say he was psychic. He stumbled into being psychic when they started questioning how he knew so much. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a big setup. It seems like he just kept going, you know, trying to, trying to come up with answers. That That's what I would think. Um Let's see. I'm going back through your stuff now. Um, let's see. Oh, God, no. Okay. Sandra says, a show I binge watched years ago is Sensing Murder, which is a piece of crap. Sorry. <laughs> Not that I have an opinion, which was an Australian and New Zealand psychic TV show that used psychics to help solve murders. Real or not, it was fun to watch. Yeah, there's there, there's a bunch of those shows and it pisses me off every time because they are such lying dogs and they should not interfere with crime. I mean, it's it's a it's a cruel thing. You've got somebody who's been murdered, whatever. You want to give an analysis. I don't have a problem with that because you say it's an analysis. But you're sitting going, oh, psychically, I'm seeing this and that. It's sick. It is sick and psychopathic and I have no place in no, I can't get them a, a break on that. And I know people like those shows because, oh, my God, they're so interested in the psychic says this. Yeah, she's a lying con artist, a psychopath. Yeah, I don't think we should give shows to psychopaths. I don't know. It just angers me. Um, it does. Uh, wrestler, I like. OK, uh, Wrestler is my favorite FBI profiler. I did get a chance to meet Robert Wrestler once. I liked him a lot. Um, I, I find his book is the one book I would read. If I were reading a, one of the books from, uh, I, I personally say, I don't have, I don't have a lot of love for Douglas and his books. I just don't. I think I've got issues, a lot of issues with him. Robert Ressler, I think is a really good hearted guy. He used a lot of deductive profiling along with the methodologies of the inductive methodologies, the FBI. Uh, I think a very honorable guy, a very honest guy. I like Robert Ressler a lot. So, um, yeah, R read Robert Ressler's books. Uh, I, I do think he's good. And he contributed a lot to the field. And Douglas did contribute something to the field. I'm not saying he didn't. Um, I just don't like where he took off with his books, which are a lot of brag books and a lot of misinformation and sometimes uh, stuff that's just simply not true. That's just my opinion on that. And I can back up a few of those. Uh, anyway, um, uh, this is a good question. Marie says, how much or little, how much or little education do American police go through to become a police officer? Uh, very little. Uh, police officer, uh, most of the U.S. Some places require that you have a bachelor's degree. That's in a few locations, but most locations require you be of, of, of adult age. I think uh, 21 years old. Um, you go to police academy where you learn 
their methodologies of, you know, arresting people. You learn the law. You learn what you can and cannot do, how not to mess up stuff. Uh, you do not learn crime scene analysis. Unfortunately, what happens, which is my whole pet peeve, is that you can be on the force for years and then one day you become a detective. But from the day you're a patrol officer to the day you become a detective, there is no schooling in between. You're not sent to detective school for three months so that you can study what I'm talking about on my shows. You don't, you don't get any of that. And nobody's reading all these books. I read, I said, I read 400 books to study profiling and crime scene analysis, forensic pathology, uh, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. Um, I've been accused of not having a proper education because I didn't have a forensic degree or a psychology degree. I have a master's degree in criminal justice, which is pretty useless, I will admit. Um, but most of my studies have been every single thing that was ever written. And I put all my efforts into learning from every single person and going to seminars as well, police seminars and so on and so forth. Um, but for a police officer going to detective, they get nothing. Most of them get nothing. And it's, it's wrong. I think they should go to detective school and at least get that, to, even if it's just three months, just even just to learn the basics. And I think you can take a lot of that garbage, which is academia and just chuck that stuff and narrow it down. And that's what I'm going to do on my show with the different segments of my school. I want to have specific topics. Like I, here's what you need to know. I could go on for five hours about criminal profiling and its history and, and the arguments over it and all the methodology, blah, 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 blah. Or I can just tell you what you need to know. <laughs> you know? Let's go straight to the because you don't, a lot of detectives, they're working so hard, they don't have time for ac academic stuff that goes on for months on end. And it's, and it's, and it's, a, it's all very couched in fancy words and stuff like that. And when you're finished, you're like, huh? You know, they need solid information. And there's certain books out there which are very good books. And those are the ones I recommend and will recommend on my channel. Like if you're going to read a book on homicide investigation, read this one. If you're going to read a book on psych psychopathy, read this one. Don't read 10 stupid books. Read this one. I'm not even recommending my own books on that necessarily. So there are books out there, which I think like Inside the Criminal Mind by uh, Dr. Stanton Saminov, my favorite guy of all time for psychopathy. He writes a great book on that. Every police officer and detective should read that book because in a very short period of time, because he writes clearly and concisely and has great experience working at uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital but the mentally insane, what he learned about psychopathy and psychopaths and how they manipulate. And it's, it's a brilliant book and it's, it's wonderful. And he's, he's one of my favorites that gets to the point. And yet you can buy another book that's 500 pages long, full of psychiatric crap. And by the time you're finished, you still don't even know what it is. You know, what's a psychopath? I'm, I'm got confused. Is it a sociopath? <laughs> anyway. So yeah. So I, I like, I like wrestler. I think his book the best. Um, Oh, thank you very much, Brady. Truth. That is why we love you, Pat. You tell us critical thinking is necessary. It, it, we have to be able to critically think. We have to be able to analyze and and also question. There's nothing wrong with questioning. As a matter of fact, being devil's advocate, even for oneself, is really important because sometimes, you know, <laughs> I mean, I've woke up in the middle of the night and gone, did I miss something? <laughs> I don't think I was right about that. And then I start playing devil's advocate because I might not be right. Maybe you're right, you know, and that's why I believe in teamwork as well, because you just have to get to the point where, you know, you start you know, being able to work toward as a tool. Again, it's like profiling and crime scene analysis as a tool, work toward getting the evidence. This guy, they never got any evidence that proves he did it. They're suspicious as heck that he did it. They think he did it, but they don't have any proof that he did it outside of his confessions, which are awfully interesting. Oh, they weren't confessions. I'm sorry. Visions. <laughs> visions. 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 Um. <laughs> you hate that cat. <laughs> no, I don't really hate Ziggy. I don't hate Ziggy. I have so many pictures of Ziggy, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, cute little pictures of Ziggy. Ziggy, but Ziggy was literally the worst cat I've ever owned. I mean, he was. He just he tried to kill me, I don't know how many times. But then but then he also sat there on my lap and kept me company and snuggled with me. And, you know, I just, I just joke about him because he is the worst kind of, <laughs> but I had him for 17 years and I never got rid of him. So he owned me. Ah. <laughs> Pat's nemesis is Ziggy. 
Sherlock Holmes Moriarty. <laughs> it was an interest. The best thing I ever did was move to a flat uh, to a, to a one floor house because when I lived in a three floor house, I mean, my God, I'm surprised I survived that cat. He would, you know, minute I walked down the stairs, he'd weave between my feet and try to kill me. So uh, good old Ziggy. I do miss him though. I mean, it's kind of quiet around here with no Ziggy. So. <laughs> I'm glad you were here, Elisa, 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 Elisa. Very interesting case. Yes, I think it's a fascinating one. Um, let's see. Oh, Mary says, okay, Pat, didn't quote me on that, but you didn't rip my theory apart. Wait a minute. Well, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Well, let's see. Let me check out your rest of the things before I go here. Let's see. Let's see. Um, <laughs> your friend take out the garbage at night you know that you may make think that's a, kind of a joke but and you don't want to be a volunteer but that's true because my garbage cans are at the back the bottom of a path i mean we have a driveway that goes down and i've i have walked my garbage out there at night and generally speaking there's not much goes on back and forth at night but you know if that one guy comes along when i'm putting the garbage out that could be the end of me um, <laughs> could be the end of me. Um, so, you know, taking it out during the day probably is safer. Who knows? You can't, you can't always win. Sometimes you can do everything right and you're still the unlucky sucker, you know? And that's, that's a fact. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's sad to think, but you know, so you, you can't prevent everything. And sometimes you become a victim just because you breathe and you, and you, you know, trying to get through life. You got to go to work. You got to go to sleep at night. And somehow somebody still breaks into your house and kills you. Nothing you can do. You know, uh, <laughs> academics. No, no. My problem with academic academia is that I think they complicate a lot of things. And I know I've written a book on Cleopatra, for example. And what I read when I read all the books on Cleopatra, I saw a lot of academics that didn't focus on the facts, and they kind of just told stories, and then they told um, they they went into a lot of stuff that you like when you finish reading it didn't really add up to anything so i'm not against all academia but i found the same thing with with with, with uh profiling and psychology and all stuff i see so much bloated stuff it's so bloated i'm like hey can we just make it make sense clarity is important and you can be an academic who's clear so there's some there's definitely people who are in academia have written great books who are very clear and precise and factual and very interesting but then there's a lot of bloat and the bloat bothers me because when you have that, you can't see things, the forest for the tree kind of thing. And I think that when it comes down to detective work, you don't have time for the bloat. You just don't, you got, you got to be able to, you, you, know, you got that first 48 and then you're screwed, you know, so you got to do what you got to do in a very short period of time. You can't sit there going, so what's our argument on, is it a sociopath or a psychopath? What is the difference between the two of them? Not it's just a, just a label. Just get over it. <laughs> if the guy, the serial killer, is a psychopath, call him a sociopath. I don't care. We want to get the guy. That that's what we want to do. So, and that's why I'm like that. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see. Anything left here? So I want to touch on before I. <laughs> oh, you don't, Michaela. You don't have to sign up. It's going to be free on the internet. It's just going to be it's going to be my videos, but it's going to be in a playlist. I'm going to have five different playlists for the school. Uh, it's going to be serial homicide, forensic pathology, crime scene analysis, criminal profiling, and <laughs> psychopathy. So five five things. And it's going to be so each one I do is going to be a shorter version at, that is about a specific aspect of each one of these things. So you can just click on something and learn that. Uh, and, a, uh, and a police officer who wants to be a detective or a detective who's already out there can be sitting in the cruiser going, I got I kind of kill my I'm drinking coffee and sitting here on some boring, you know, three hours thing. I can just click on things and listen to a short version of something that I can gain some information. And I think that would be very valuable instead of having to work, you know, because sometimes you don't you can't go to school. You can't go to these big training courses. It just doesn't happen. I want to have that available to everybody, including criminal justice students. And people in, in many, many fields, and they can click on things and learn from them. And that's that. So, you know, I'm going to do that. It's going to be available for everybody. It's nothing, it's not going to be, uh, there's no, there's no cost and it's not going to be hidden. So no sign up. 
I could do that, but I, I, I don't want to. So I'm not going to. Um, let's see. Uh, this is uh, like this promoted Gavin De Becker's Gift of Fear. Good book. That's one of my, that's one of the ones I like. <laughs> yes, I do. Excellent book. Excellent book. Um, so anyway, I think I'll stop with that. Um, so anyway. Uh, yes, I'm uh, during when I put the book I, when I do the different areas too. I will put my favorite books up there so that you can see the best books I think in each area um, that I think are the most useful for. If you've got a short amount of time, you're not going to read four to four hundred, five hundred books. That because I spent a lot of time reading stuff that was really not that great. Doesn't mean I didn't learn from that book, and maybe they recommended another book which is even better. But I'm going to pick out the top top books that if you were going to study this just do these two books or do these five books or whatever, not these hundred books, but here's the best of the best. And again, it's not that you can't have fascination and go into things. I've read some really interesting books, which are very convoluted, very, sometimes very academic, but in that they had some interesting section, which I just learned a lot from. So I'm not saying don't read everything. I mean, definitely do that if you got the time, but if you don't, I want to, I want to pick out the best stuff so that you can, you can learn as quickly as possible if you, especially if you're a detective or a police officer, you can learn as quickly as possible um, and not, you know, go get some book that's useless and you spend a lot of time reading something. You could have read something better. You know? So I'll recommend all my favorite books that I've learned from um, so that, yeah, I want to be helpful to people in that sense. Uh, and so this hopefully will, it'll, I'll, I'll roll it out as time goes on. It's just a lot of work. So I haven't quite accomplished it. Or I will be doing it slowly. So little by little, I'll be putting out one one video and then another video. And over time, if you came back in three years, you'd see maybe fifty videos on each one of these, uh, each one of these uh, playlists for the school. But in the beginning, it'll be like one and then two, you know, one, so I can get it in here with everything else. So, <laughs> um, oh, isn't that nice? I've taken a lot of sources, but you're the best teacher for me. That makes a lot of sense. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Again, you should take in more than one source. I mean, you should, because otherwise, you know, again, again, you end up with a guru. And I, I you know, I like, I, I have people, I, 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 mentors, mentors are fine, but you shouldn't just have one that you just think that's that person's all that and nobody else is anything, you know, that's, that puts you in a, in a place where you're, Stop, stop becoming a free thinker and you, and you shouldn't do that. You should always be able to appreciate, even if you, I mean, we don't even have to like everything that person writes and people don't have to like everything I write or everything I do, but if they can learn something and they should say, okay, I never liked that woman, but man, that one time she said something good. <laughs> it's like, okay. I'm happy that you got the one thing out of it. Maybe that'll make a difference. You know, maybe that's the thing that solved the case for you that you learned something from me. If you didn't like my personality, you, think I laugh too much or, you know, you don't like my credentials, but that one thing you learned helped you with the case. I've done my job. So that's my theory on that. Anyway, <laughs> wait a minute. You can't die before my academy kicks off. I mean, I'm already 67. I got to, I know I got to push it, but <laughs> I'm getting there. Believe me, I'm getting there. Don't, don't, don't kick off. Don't kick off. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you're most welcome and good night, everybody, too. So anyway, if you're still still here after all this, do join, do join Patreon, do subscribe to the channel, and I will see you soon on another case. Bye. <laughs>